Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. Behind the Masterpiece. The man behind the masterpiece today, Joseph Mallard William Turner, starring Burford Hamden. London in the early 19th century. A huge, sprawling city with narrow, crooked streets crowded with carriages and wagons, street hawkers, and vendors of lavender and spruce. Elegant ladies in ruffles and hoops turn up their dainty noses as they ride by on their crested phaetons. On this particular day, a handsome cab, drawn by a prancing black horse, stops in front of number 47 Queen Anne Street. The house is a ramshackle two-story affair, unpainted and unwashed. The windows are dirty and shuttered. A dignified man dressed in the height of fashion gets out of the cab. He walks up to the house distastefully avoiding some rubbish lying on the splintered wooden steps and knocks on the door. Well, what do you want? I'm looking for Joseph William Turner, the artist. I was told he lived here. Who are you? John Ruskin, the art critic. Uh, what do you want to see me about? Are you Turner? Does it surprise you so much? What do you expect to see? A primped-up dandy in a powdered wig? I like to wear these old rags. I haven't got time to wash my face. I'm too busy painting. But, but this house, it, it's so dilapidated and dirty. I never expected to find you living in a place like this. Nobody's asking you what you expected or what you didn't. I didn't ask you to come here, and I don't want you here, so you can take your fine airs and your fancy clothes and get out. Well, sir, I can assure you I've no desire to stay another moment. This much I must tell you. I'll never understand why you, the wealthiest and most successful artist in England, should live in such filth and dirt. Now, of course, you wouldn't understand. Nobody would. Nobody knows why I live like I do. But I've got a reason. And a very good reason. And you nor nobody else will ever find out till I die. Now, get out! <laughs> These are the life stories of the artists behind the masterpieces the world loves and cherishes. Presented each week at this time by a featured company of America's finest radio actors. From past geniuses down through our contemporary Americans, we shall show you how they've given you, our listeners, a priceless heritage. Ladies and gentlemen, may we introduce Dr. Bernard Myers, eminent art critic and New York University lecturer. Our host for this period, Dr. Myers. Thank you, Hugh James. The years between 1775 and 1851, the years of Turner's life, are among the most exciting in history, encompassing the French Revolution and Napoleon, the Industrial Revolution and Manufacturing, Overseas Trade, and Imperialism. For the artists and poets of the early 19th century, Nature and its moods became a refuge against the commercialization of the age, an instrument that accompanied their nostalgic lament for a more congenial world. The life of Turner is a symbol of this protest. Brought up in the teeming slums of 18th century London, the precocious Turner was a journeyman artist at 10, a student of Sir Joshua Reynolds at 14, and a practicing artist at the age of 18. He made a great deal of money, but he continued to live like a very poor man, in filth and squalor, there was a reason for his living the way he did. A reason that intrigued the famous critic, Sir John Ruskin. There was a reason for living the way he did. A very good reason. As I thought about this, my curiosity was aroused. There must be an answer. Somewhere in his past, somewhere among the people he'd met and known, the places he'd been was the reason. And I was determined to find it. I 
I made inquiries, wrote to many people, interviewed others, seeking the answer. In my search, I met a middle-aged woman living in Margate, in a beautiful mansion just off the ocean. Her name was Sarah Cowler. When she was young, she must have been very pretty. She told me that many years ago she'd met Turner in Margate. He was uncouth and boorish, and dressed in rough, slipshod clothes. There was so much vitality and energy in him that she, from the upper stratum of British society, found him fascinating. She vividly recalled the day Turner took her walking by the ocean side and told her his thoughts. Sarah, w- when I look at the ocean surging at my feet, I get such a feeling of strength in my body. I, I think I could conquer the whole world. Keep talking, Billy. I love to listen to you talk. I've never met anyone like you before. When I see the sea and the sun shining on it and the waves rushing at me, it does something to me. It makes me feel so, so clean. I was born in the slums in London in Maiden Lane. Well, not that I'm ashamed of it, mind you, I ain't. But I get a strange feeling to paint the ocean and the sky and the waves like no one's ever painted them before because I know what they feel like. The... Do you understand, Sarah? Of course, Billy. I understand perfectly. You want to be a great painter, and I'm sure you will be one one day. Yeah, I, I ain't got much education. I know my talk ain't refined and cultured like yours. My tongue gets all twisted. I, I can't say what I mean, but... Sir, this, this is something I want to ask you. I've been meaning to ask you for days now. I, I, I ain't had the courage. Yes, Billy. What is it? I'll be a great painter someday and make a lot of money and live in a big house like yours and have dozens of servants waiting on me and a foot just like you have. Oh, so I'm, I'm asking you to marry me. What? You're not serious, Billy. Oh, of course I am. I love you, Sarah. I want you to be my wife. But I never dreamed you would have such thoughts in your mind. Oh, why not? I'll be a great painter someday. I won't always be poor. <laughs> if you had all the money in the world, I wouldn't consider marrying you. Not for a moment. Oh, why not? What's wrong with me? I ain't got much education, but I can get it. When I get money, I can get anything I want. Oh, come now, sir. Say you'll marry me. There's a good girl. Take uh, your hand off me. The very thought of being married to you turns my stomach. Huh? Yes, you were born in the slums, all right, and that's where you belong. Uh. You're coarse and vulgar. All the money in the world wouldn't change you. You'll always belong in the slums. Why, if I ever married you, my friends would laugh in my face. Me married to you? (laughs) It's ridiculous. It's too ridiculous for words. Was that the reason? No, it might account for Turner shutting himself away from society to live a lonely, solitary life. They wouldn't account for this pinching every penny he ever made, refusing to spend a farthing even for a duster to brush off his canvases. It wouldn't account for his becoming the grasping, money-grubbing man he was, even after he'd been recognized as England's leading landscape artist. Yes, excellent... Excellent, Turner. The way you use the sunlight to illuminate the scene is superb. Uh, what do you call this? The Grand Canal Venice. I painted it when I was there last year, Sir Peter. This will be the most outstanding painting in my collection. Uh, price we agreed upon is satisfactory to you, I presume? I've been meaning to bring that up. The price is all right, but I've made up my mind you can't have that painting unless you buy these six others I brought with me. And they'll cost you ten guineas each. What? This is outrageous, Turner. I have no intention of saddling myself with six worthless canvases, even if they cost ten bob. Ten guineas is preposterous. They're good paintings, Sir Peter. You'll be able to get more than I want for them. Here, here. Wait, take a look. Uh, Perhaps they are good, but I don't want them. Then you can't have the one you want. You can't do this to me, Turner. I've told my friends I was purchasing that painting. You can't go back on your word. I look like a fool. I changed my mind. That's me offer. Take it or leave it. This is highway robbery, and you know it. I have no choice. I want that painting. Very well, Turner. I'll take the other six. <laughs> I thought you would. You're getting a bargain, Sir Peter. Yes, yes, yes. I'll write you a check for the full amount. Ten guineas. Six. Yeah. There you are, Turner. Here's a check for the paintings. Mm, no, that ain't right. Well, you've forgotten the six shillings from a coach fare coming here. I want that too. A 
Strange paradox of a man, Miss Turner. Penny-pinching, miserly, savoring every cent at the sacrifice of appearance, health, and friends. And yet when he learned that his boyhood friend Tom Girton, once a wealthy society artist, had died alone and penniless, he hurried to his home. Well, well what are you staying around for? Aren't you supposed to take the body away for burial? Uh, I ain't been paid nothing for me work, mister, and I ain't moving nothing until I gets me pay. You mean there ain't no money? So there ain't no one what'll pay for his funeral? That's right, Governor. He gets buried in Potter's Field, but he don't get moved till I gets me pay. No. No. He, he was my best friend when I was trying to make a name for myself. He, he didn't laugh at me. No, he don't get buried in Potter's Field. You see that he gets a fine coffin made with mahogany and, and a satin lining inside. Oh. <laughs> and uh, who's going to pay for all this, Gavin? I am. I'll pay for it. Oh, and who are you? Never mind that. I don't want nobody to know who paid for this. I, I don't want anyone ever to know. But he deserves it. He, he was my friend. He, he didn't laugh at me. On the one hand, a miser. On the other, generous. When it came to his few friends. What? was the reason. And why did this man who could paint such wonderfully delicate and beautiful pictures of the land and the sea, why did he act like a wild beast at times? Once the Royal Academy gave him a testimonial, the highest respect an artist could be paid. Great artists and professors from all over the world came to the Academy to pay him homage. It gives me great pleasure to present the guest of honor this afternoon, Professor of Perspective at the Royal Academy, and one of England's best-known artists, Joseph Mallard William Tanner. Uh, I don't know why you wanted me to come here today. Uh, what I mean is, I ain't much on speaking. I, I don't know what to say. I, I suppose I should thank you for coming here, but... If you hadn't been satisfied with my paintings, well, you wouldn't have come here, so uh, why should I thank you? Uh, well, that, that, that ain't what I mean. If, if it was up to me, well, uh, I wouldn't have come here because, well, seeing as uh, I ain't such a blooming good speaker, but uh, the point is, well, why don't you, you leave me alone? Well, why do you come bothering me all the time with all this nonsense. Why don't you go home where you belong? You're supposed to be artists, aren't you? Then why are you sitting here listening to me babbling? Why aren't you painting? That's where I could be now, at home, painting. I haven't got time to stand here talking to you. Get out. Get out, all of you. I can't waste my time here. I'm going home to paint. 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 That's where I belong. And still I did not know why Turner lived the way he did. I still did not know the reason. We will continue the story of Turner in a few moments. In the meantime, if you want to increase your enjoyment of this series, The Man Behind the Masterpiece, we suggest you obtain the fine color prints of Turner and other great artists. And here is your local announcer to tell you how to get them. And now back to The Man Behind the Masterpiece and the story of Joseph Mallard William Turner. I continued my search through Turner's life, trying to find the clue that I felt must be there. The clue that would account for this strange man's life. This great artist who painted like an angel and lived like a pig. Who could have had all of England at his feet and who lived alone like a hermit. I found out more about that house on Queen Anne Street. He had an old housekeeper there, a Hannah Danby, ugly disfigured woman, who kept an army of cats running at will around the place. 
real. Hannah, how many times have I told you not to bother me when I'm painting? And get those blasted cats out of here. I don't mean to disturb you, Master William, but I've got to have some money to buy some wood. It's cold in the house. I need wood for the fireplace. You don't need no wood and tight enough in here. I ain't cold. I'm fair shivering from the cold. Well, you needn't come begging for money because you ain't going to get it and I can't afford it. I'm saving my money, I am. What are you saving your money for? That's what I want to know. You've got more than ten rich men now. I got my reasons, old one, and they're very good reasons, too. Now get out and let me get back to my work. All right, I'm going. But you needn't be so touchy with me. You don't have to yell at me all the time as if I was some common scullery maid. Hm. I can remember there was a time when I wasn't so displeasing to you. <laughs> This was the same man who, living in squalor and filth and dirt, loved the ocean and the salt air and ships. Once Turner was on a ship in the English Channel during a great gale. The wind came rushing down, bringing the rain and the waves crashing against the ship, sending it almost end over end. All hands were ordered below, but Turner insisted on standing on the deck, his body drenched by the torrents of rain. And because he refused to leave the deck, they lashed him to the mast. For four hours he stayed there... While the gale tore at him in all its fury, the elements threatened to toss the ship bow over stern. That's it! Tear at me! Kill rain and waves! Dash into my face! That's what I want! The cold, clean ocean will wash away the filth of my body and soul! Come at me, you angry storm! Blow in with all your fury! <sighs> you don't frighten me! And if I live through this night... I'll paint you so that even the most ignorant scum in the dirtiest streets in London will know what a storm is like, and they'll know what a wonderful thing is nature. So blow at me, you gale, you rain, and you wind, blow, blow! What was the reason? Perhaps the reason lay in the double life that Turner assumed in his last years when he kept a separate residence near the sea, unknown to anyone in London. There he dressed himself in a seafaring costume, and everyone knew him as Admiral Booth. Most of his time was spent in the tavern near his home. There he would stay as shabby, back as carousing and chattering, till both the brandy and the evening were ended. Timmy, Timmy, my glass is empty. <laughs> Fill her up, Timmy, my boy. Come in, Admiral. I'm bringing another bottle right up. Ah, uh, that's right, Timmy. You take care of Admiral Boo, and the Admiral take care of you. Here you are, Admiral. Ah, uh, <laughs> thank you, Timmy. Now, Admiral, maybe you better take it a little easy on the drinking. You've been growing at it pretty heavy this evening, and it ain't healthy. Ah, yeah, sure, sure, Timmy, sure. Here, <laughs> come in. Do you know who I am? Why, sure, you're Admiral Booth. Everybody knows that. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. I'm Admiral Booth. But uh, do you know who else I am? <laughs> no, Admiral, I don't. Oh, and then I'll tell you. I'm Turner. Joseph Mallard William Turner. Have you heard of Turner, Timmy? Of course I have, Admiral. He's England's greatest painter. I've seen lots of his sea pictures. Well, that's who I am, no, Turner. No, Admiral, take it easy. You're getting yourself excited. <laughs> of course you turn. No, you don't believe me, but I don't care. I am Turner. I'm telling you this, Timmy, because <laughs> I can talk to you. Timmy, those art critics there yeah, have been sneering at me for years, but I've been going on making more and more money until now. I've got enough. Yes, Timmy. Now I've got enough for what I want. Let them laugh and stare at me now. All they want. At last, I've got the last laugh. I... <coughs> Edward, what's the matter with you? I, 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 I... Over 70 years of constantly driving himself, painting thousands of canvases and tens of thousands of sketches, fighting the world and himself, finally proved too much even for Turner's enormous peasant vitality. He collapsed in the tavern and was taken to his home, the home, that is, of Admiral Booth. And it was there that I found him dying, with his reason for living the way he did still unanswered. How are you feeling, Mr. Turner? Eh? Who's there? Do I know you? I'm John Ruskin, the art critic. I met you once. Do you remember? Art critic? 
Uh, what do you want? Uh, get out of here. I'm your friend, Turner. In fact, I can prove it. I've written a book defending you and stating that, in my opinion, you're the greatest artist in England today. Have you? Well, uh, you've got some sense, then. <sighs> Turner. Turner? Are you still awake? Huh? Yes. I'm still awake. Oh, what, what do you want? When I first met you, you told me you had a very good reason for living the way you did, in filth and dirt, hoarding all your money. Turner, what was that reason? 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 I was saving my money. I couldn't spend anything unless I had to. I wanted just enough to live. I was saving my money. But why, Turner, why? In that drawer over there, by the window, you'll find my will. I'll tell you why. Do you see now why I lived the way I did? Why I sacrificed the sun and the sky all my life? Even though I loved it so. I was born in dirt rescue. I had to struggle. I made up my mind that I would leave all my money, every last farthing of it, to the young struggling artists coming after me. So they would have it a bit easier than I did. So, so that they wouldn't get discouraged and give up and maybe lose some great paintings to the world. That's why I, I couldn't spend no money, Ruskin. I wanted to make it so I could leave it to them that was coming after me. <coughs> Turner, what's the matter? <laughs> it's getting dark in the room, Ruskin. I can't see so good no more. Hey, tell me, tell me, tell me. Is, is the sun still shining? Yes, it's still shining, Turner. Over there on the Thames River. Can you see it? No, well, uh, yes. Yes. I can see it. Ah. I'm glad it's shining, Ruskin. It makes me feel warm and clean to see it. You know, I think sometimes that God is the sun. And, and sometimes I think that, that the sun is God. And now, here's our host again, Dr. Bernard Myers. Dr. Myers. Our picture of the week, Tanner's Grand Canal Venice, from the original at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, is one of the most exciting and modern of all his works. Like many of his pictures, the Grand Canal Venice is very carefully laid out, and here balanced with heavy masses at left and right, with gondolas spaced across the picture at regular intervals. But all of these effects are only background for the most important element, the light and its reflections. Look at your color print again. And see how the buildings are reflected by yellowish light in the water, while the gondolas with their tiny gondoliers also yield colored reflections of the original forms. This contrast of careful composition and vivid reflecting light, so typical of Turner, is one of the factors that gives his art its emotional impact. In this particular painting, the contrast is heightened by the difference between the precise drawing of the buildings along the sides of the canal and the sketchy impressionist rendering of the boats and their little people. It is this sketchy approach, this vivid, clean coloration, that makes Turner one of the most important ancestors of modern Impressionism. Let me close with a quotation from a letter written 35 years after Turner's death. I quote, A group of French painters fighting for the last ten years against conventional painting to bring art back to an exact observation of nature by studying the reality of form and motion, as well as the transitory effects of light, cannot forget that it was preceded in this path by a great master of the English school, Turner. This letter was signed by Degas, Monet, Renoir, Mary Cassatt, and Cicely. Friends, in just a moment, Dr. Myers will be back to tell you about next week's program in The Man Behind the Masterpiece. Right now, here's an important message from another friend.
And now, ladies and gentlemen, the eminent art critic and our host for this series, Dr. Bernard Myers. Next week, friends, we are going to bring you the story of Francois Boucher, the celebrated Rococo painter of 18th century France. The story of his career as court painter to Louis XV and friend of Madame de Pompadour will be the next episode in our series. Be sure to listen in again next week, same time, same station, when the man behind the masterpiece will bring you the exciting story of Francois Boucher. The man behind the masterpiece, prepared under supervision of Dr. Bernard Myers, is written by Erwin Lewis, produced and directed by Mitchell Grayson. The cast for Turner's story included Burford Hamden starring as Turner, Brett Morrison as John Ruskin, Abby Lewis as Sarah Cowler, and William Podmore as Timmy. Original music by John Garth. Hugh James speaking. <laughs>